Well, here with me in the studio, Nabila Ramdani, uh, journalist and Middle East analyst. Nabila, nice to see you again. Um, let's talk about today's developments um, first, which are the, uncover, the uncovering of these documents that appear to show the CIA worked very closely with the Gaddafi regime, as did uh, MI6 here in the UK. Um, specifically, Tony Blair and Colonel Gaddafi, we knew that there was uh, a relationship being established there. Oh, how, it, how much... How deep did it go, do you think? Well, there is no doubt that in later years, in recent years, uh, Colonel Gaddafi was trying to soften his image uh, internationally. I mean, domestically, he was still very much the brute, uh, the ruthless despot. But internationally, he was desperately trying to make a comeback on the international stage. And Tony Blair played a crucial role in, 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 in uh, rehabilitating him. And um, uh, in, not least because he convinced him also to give up his nuclear weapons program and also encourage him to invite uh, Anglo-Saxon investments uh, in Libya. Uh, I also broke the story that um, uh, Tony Blair was in fact an advisor to Colonel Gaddafi and he was uh, visiting Tripoli no later than uh, last summer, for example. Uh, Gaddafi was also embarking on a massive PR operation, uh, signing uh, deals with high-profile international PR companies uh, he was giving lectures to uh, prominent seats uh, of learning in, in the learning in the UK, uh, for example, not least of all the LSE and uh, Oxford University. And there is also uh, uh, there are also UK uh, former UK diplomats who were uh, involved in helping uh, save Gaddafi, for example, research his controversial PhD uh, at the LSE. So there is no doubt that the links between the UK, but also the US and the Gaddafi regime were uh, tightening over the uh, recent years. And you mentioned domestically at the beginning of your answer there. I mean, how, how was it felt among the Libyan people that the, the international community, the West, was embracing, is probably too strong a word, but welcoming Gaddafi in, uh, while the Libyan people presumably were, were suffering the same fate as they always had? Were they, were they angry then with the West? There was certainly a, a strong sense of resentment at uh, how the West was eager to rehabilitate somebody who uh, obviously uh, had a, a a an, op an appalling track record for abuses of human rights at home, and he was given many opportunities to make a, a you know a, a comeback almost as a rock star on the international stage. He was welcomed by President Sarkozy no less than four years ago. He was allowed to plant his tent right across the Elysee Palace. Was given a tour of the Palace of Versailles and uh, dined at the Ritz, and, uh, and, and, and at the time, President Sarkozy was hoping to seal lucrative uh, deals to sell him fighter jets. The, the, the tables have turned. We're now in a situation in Libya where it appears that this small area around Sirte and, and South Sabah is, is where Colonel Gaddafi, his sons, may well be. The uh, rebels have, have stopped their advance. They are trying to negotiate the way out. But it, it almost looks like becoming guerrilla warfare. Well, absolutely. And it's interesting to note, actually, that there is actually a reversal of, uh, of, of, in the roles. Uh, Gaddafi is literally the rebel fighter here, but he uh, has a big problem because he's fighting NATO. And in my opinion, he's got no chance against NATO's surveillance uh, capabilities, let alone firepower. And let's not forget that Libya is a huge country, seven times the size of the UK, and not an ideal environment for uh, guerrilla warfare, not least because it, it is extremely difficult for you know, supply lines to, uh, to work. And uh, he will be also very careful not using any communication device, which could be picked up uh, quite easily by NATO forces. Nabila, you've... Um, in met Colonel Gaddafi and spoken with his sons um, before. I, I'm interested that we get these audio recordings coming out. We had two from two of the sons this week and then from Colonel Gaddafi as well on, on these um, television channels. He, he gives this message. Do you really believe that he is um, has deluded himself, that he thinks he can still win this? Or, or why is he putting up that show? I think it's a clear sign of desperation. It's, you know, it's with nearing the end of his regime. And I think what he wants to avoid at all costs by constantly appealing to his hardcore, limited, but dare I say potent supporters, is he desperately wants to avoid the kind of humiliating international trial that Saddam Hussein uh, was uh, confronted with, let alone a domestic trial, uh, Mubarak style. Mm. And he would rather die in his country than, you know, be... Uh, face that humiliating uh, show trial.
In terms of the National Transitional Council, they've said they're moving their offices to Tripoli uh, this Wednesday, um, a, a huge task. They, there is no judicial system that they can operate by. They, they're going to rely on the help of the international community, but also sort matters out for themselves. Uh, in, in some ways, it makes it easier for them if they don't have to deal with an alive former leader. I think it's crucial for the country to be able to move on that Gaddafi should be captured uh, sooner rather than later. I think the move of the National Transitional Council from Benghazi to Tripoli is also quite important symbolically. But before you know, they can start talking elections, and, and, and of course it's going to be hugely challenging given that there hasn't been any political structure in Libya for over 40 years, they should create the right environment for that. And that includes safety and the restoration of law and order, not only because this is crucial for the spread of democracy, but it's also important for uh, international investors to uh, do business. Nabila, thank you very much for that. We'll talk again later for now. Thank you.